Welcome, everybody, to Broadcast Team Alpha, where we bring you cutting-edge conversation while exploring the quantum possibilities. And we are really going to do it again tonight. We are so excited for our guests. But before we get started, as always, I just want to thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for the lively chat that has been going on in the chat conversation while exploring the quantum possibility. Thank you for your We are really going to do it again tonight. We are so excited for our guests. But before we get started, as we are dreaming over there, welcome, everybody. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for the lively chat that has been going on in the chat conversation while exploring the quantum Thank you for being there. We are really yeah. going so to do it again tonight. We are so excited for our guests. 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 We are so excited for our for the new world, for peace, for personal reasons, for health. And we've had some pretty incredible results from what we do. If you'd like to join us, send an email to the CAT Mastermind Connection at gmail.com. Augie will send you the link. You can come in, see if you like us, and see if you like what we're doing. And maybe you'll become part of the amazing group of people that are there. So without any further ado, Augie, yeah. please tell us about our very phenomenal guest. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, this is going to be fun because we have Michael Schratt with us. Uh, he is a military aerospace historian, and he is a digger. He <laughs> finds stuff that hardly anybody else can get their hands on. and. Uh, People come to him with stuff, too, so we're going to hear some about that. He's also the author of the book Dark Files, and that book has 61 fully illustrated UFO encounters from around the world, and uh, pictures, folks. It's got pictures on just about every page. You can see what it looked like before. With the crashes and the crafts and the drawings and the illustrations, I love books with pictures because this is this is something that you really got to go have a look at. And he is getting this information from the people that have boots on the ground where it actually happened a lot of times. And uh, those are some of the people that even come to him would say, "Hey, I I was there. I know." So. Uh, that, that you can't get any closer than that. And he is also a speaker, a lecturer, and a guest on shows and conferences just about everywhere. He spent most of his time now researching and has developed contacts in the deep, dark waters of governmental top secret and black programs and some, because there is some, there is a different world out there in those arenas, one that we have never been told about and probably never will, but there is some really interesting stuff and we're gonna hear about that. And of course, <laughs> being a pilot, I've got to say this too. Michael is a pilot also, and he also spoke at the largest air show in the world at Oshkosh, Wisconsin a few years back. And uh, I've been to those, uh, that the so-called fly-ins and the air shows, and it's phenomenal. So that was at least a fun note, and uh, we want to hear the rest of the story, Michael. Welcome to the show. Mm -hmm. oh, great to be Welcome, with you. Welcome, Michael. Great to be with you. So good. Mm -hmm. So exciting to have you here. And I am just so curious, Michael, how did this come about for you? I mean... You know, some people tell us, you know, there were there were little r road uh, signs along the way when they were little kids, and right. it didn't really follow the the normal trajectory, normal in air quotes. How did this happen for you? It's so fascinating. I've had an interest in aviation my entire life from a very early age. 
my dad used to take me to these old air museums where they had these World War II aircraft parked outside and they were sitting there for decades and the, the paint was chipped and the windows were oxidized and they were cracked and uh, a lot of the flight controls had uh, a skeleton appearance to it and it just had this ghostly appeal when you see like a b-25 just sitting out in the in the weeds you know that really sparked my interest in aviation and then you know as you mentioned going to oshkosh air show you know and then i started tracking the more obscure aircraft the aircraft that we don't hear too much about some of the things that were procured within the black world and then things just led one to another into this whole concept of the ufo crash retrievals and i knew that it would be the crash retrievals that could help to end the quote unquote cosmic watergate and, and hopefully tonight we'll be able to consider some of these uh more important retrieval operations yes yeah gosh wow. there's so much to talk about there i don't know uh, where would you prefer to start well we can start the uh presentation whenever you're ready so yeah that would be all right yeah let's do it should we do it all right let's do so it let's go ahead and do this you want right. to share screen share screen yep we'll go here uh i think we want to go here share okay uh i think we got that okay. there we go mm -hmm. all right and we want to say slideshow from beginning here uh let's see home slideshow from beginning okay so do you see this full screen yeah we can see it you see that full screen okay so this is kind of like the first slide in this whole presentation here and the overall umbrella term of this powerpoint presentation is retrievals of the third kind Cosmic crashes, corpses, and cover-ups. And uh, I kind of want to begin here. UFO crash retrievals, the ultimate holy grail of UFO research. Now, why is it called the ultimate holy grail of UFO research? It's, it's simple, actually, because when you talk about crash retrievals, the crash retrievals have the body, the debris, and the craft. And that is the physical evidence that we're going to need the armor, the tools, you know, the actual physical evidence that we're going to need to move this entire field forward. Because, you know, we've all been doing this for decades now. If you take it all the way back to 1947, <clears throat> we can go further back than that. I mean, this this whole cosmic Watergate has been going on for decades. We're, we're, we're absolutely pushing 80 years now. And if we don't make a management decision if we don't take the bull by the horns and get radical with this whole concept of crash retrievals, UFO research, uh, we're going to be here another 80 years, and we're still not going to know the truth. That's why the crash retrievals are the holy grail to this whole concept. We've got to get this pinned down, and this is the final curtain call on, on UFO disclosure, because if we don't run these to ground, if we don't find the remaining legacy witnesses, the first-hand military witnesses to these cases, we are going to be lost to history. And so that's why it's important that we track these people down here. Now, before we begin, I want to hit some of these bullet items here, some of these announcements. The content of each case highlighted in this presentation has remained intact for the description of the original source. That's number one. Number two. The identity of first-hand sources will be protected per Leonard Stringfield's original agreement with his witnesses and contacts. The visual aids used in this presentation are computer-generated forensic composite illustrations and sketches, which originated from the specific details provided by Leonard sources. So where, where did I get this information? Where did Leonard get this information? This is the source material here. Three-star U.S. Air Force generals. U.S. Air Force fighter pilots, astronauts, commercial pilots, air traffic controllers, neurosurgeons, 
pathologists, theoretical physicists, and mathematicians, U.S. Army officers, U.S. Navy officers, military police, high-level Pentagon officials, top military brass, scientists and engineers who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and other government facilities. So in other words, we're talking about the best of the best, first-hand military sources who held the bodies, who were at the autopsies, who loaded these craft on 18-wheeler tractor-trailer low boy trucks, shipped them to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We're talking about the first-hand military witnesses here. Uh, a couple of quotes. Number one, UFO crash retrievals can't be real because if they were, I would have read about them in the local newspaper. So that's the first one. That's the general public. Number two, <laughs> there are not now, nor ever have been, any extraterrestrial visitors or equipment on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is from their own press release. So it's going to be the witnesses against the United States government throughout this entire presentation. And we're going to see who wins this battle at the end here. Okay, uh, I want to highlight this man right here. This is the man of the hour. This is Leonard Stringfield. He was the gentleman who coined the term UFO crash retrieval. So he gets credit for, for coining this term here. And over a period of 30 years, he developed dozens of first-hand military witnesses, kind of what we talked about in the, in the previous slide here. And we'll do a, just a quick biography. He was born in 1920. He grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. By the time he graduated high school in 1939, he already memorized the entire dictionary. So this is the kind of gentleman you, you want on your team here. He joined the military as soon as he heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. After the war, he was employed by a chemical company in Ohio. He retired after 30 years. He wrote two books, Inside Saucer Post 3-0, that was in 1957. Later, he wrote a book called Situation Red, the UFO Siege, back in 1977. The next bullet item is what's important to our discussion here tonight. His lecture on UFO crash retrievals at the 1978 MUFON Symposium in Dayton, Ohio, caused an international sensation for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, this was kind of a virgin territory back then. People really didn't, didn't, didn't know about crash retrievals. It was a new concept. Um, and when he gave his lecture at the MUFON Symposium, it was under... The concept that he would preserve an important part of our national history by getting the, all these stories out, but he had an agreement with the witnesses that their names had to be protected. So there was no way for the attendance of the, of the uh, symposium to independently verify sources. So there was some friction there. There was some pushback, but nevertheless, nevertheless, it was a watershed moment in ufology here. He passed away December 18th, 1994. Uh, so a couple of newspaper clippings here. Cincinnati Inquirer, July 19th, 1993. Author continues quest for truth about UFOs. Quote, what I've collected has staggering implications for mankind. This would be the biggest thing since Christ, really. Yeah, it is. If even one of these cases is true, it is the biggest thing since Christ. Now, Leonard maintained a collection of 22 bank boxes of original correspondence, letters, drawings, audio tapes, testimony from his sources. These witnesses should be located and their testimony should be presented before Congress. I want to make that point too. So, just before we begin here, I want to highlight this book. I've got a copy of it here. Everything we'll be talking about tonight is referenced in this book called UFO Crash Retrieval, The Complete Investigations by Leonard Stringfield, 1978 to 1994. So as we go through these cases, and I show you the, the bodies, the craft, the debris, where they were brought, how they were taken there, it's all referenced in this book. So if you want the intricate inside details of all these cases, I would request that anyone get a copy of this book. It's available on Amazon. It's not cheap, and it's not for the faint of heart because 
and you look through this book, you'll notice immediately that it's detailed, it's wordy. You know, there's a lot of detail here. It's devoid of drawings, illustrations, and sketches. So you you're you're left to your own imagination to kind of come up with what these crash retrievals look like. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because it's always kind of good to use your illustration. But what I thought is someone needs to go through this book, you know, with a fine tooth comb, page by page, pick out the mission critical cases, and then commission high quality refined sketches to be made to make these things come alive and preserve an important part of our national history. And then once that's done, those sketches will be used as a basis for a full color illustration. So over the past three years, that's what I've been doing. And that's what we hope to show you today here. Um, now, next one. Would you go to Las Vegas if you knew the odds were 119 to one in your favor, right? So there's 119 crash retrieval cases. Let's go to a roulette wheel at, at Vegas and it has 120 spaces, and you put down 119 bets, you're going to win every time. You almost can't lose. So the bottom line is, all we need is one of these cases to be real. And the whole concept of UFO crash retrievals not being authentic completely falls away. We just need one of these to be real here. Uh, I want to give credit to Rudy Gardet, who's my artist, who did the sketches in this presentation. And we're going to go ahead and begin right here. This is 1942, UFO crash retrieval at an army base north of Georgia. Now, even Leonard wasn't told where this was. So this is somewhere north of Georgia. And I'm going to give you the page numbers and the case files so that you can verify this in the books. So this is page 319 within UFO crash retrievals by Leonard Stringfield. This craft was about 15 feet in diameter. It was about 10 feet tall. There were markings hieroglyphic markings written along the outer circumference of the bottom portion of this craft. There were three levels. Upper level had a control panel with buttons and switches and dials and levers. And that's what you see on this large view on the upper right-hand side. This is all by Rudy Gardea. Now, on the second level, <clears throat> level two, there was what looked like four bar stools that were positioned in back of a wraparound window. That's what you see again in the front portion here. At the bottom, there was what looked like a trap door here. So I also want to mention that there were four crew members taken alive. They were five feet tall, 90 pounds, large black eyes, milky white skin. I'm going to go to the next slide and do an enlargement. So now you can see what these hieroglyphic letters may have looked like. And as we go through some of these cases, you'll see that markings appear on other cases as well. So what that means is that there has to be an international collaboration of scientists, lab code technicians, who have an entire library of all these markings that they can reference from, that they can pull data from, trying to decipher what this these markings mean. There has to be such an organization. It's only, you know, logical that they would have this. Okay, next one. Right Field, Dayton, Ohio, 1946. This is Tex Martin. This is page 242, 243 in the book. And I want to make mention that Wright-Patterson Air Force Base didn't exist until October 1947. It, it was known as Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, back in 1946. And you can kind of see this is Hangar Bay Complex number four and this young boy six years old his father worked at the base at the time and they were kind of between breaks here and there was a janitor who just offered to buy this young boy a, a soda and so he turned to his father and he says is it okay that this janitor gets me a soda and he said yeah go right ahead so you've got this 46 era vending machine here and he's giving this young boy this pop and so here's the rough sketch that Rudy came up with now while this is going down there's a connecting cafeteria to one of the main hangers here and a gentleman came through this door and this young boy got a peek inside this hangar 
And this is what he saw. He saw two 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boys that had tarped debris. He saw a dish-shaped craft that was off-white in color on tripod pogo landing gear. And then near this craft on the floor were three ET bodies measuring about three and a half to four feet tall. We'll get into that later here. And so here was the very first pass original sketch that Rudy came up with. And if you look in the background, you can see our, our primary eyewitness peering through the doorway here. So let's see if we can clean this up. Let's see if we can refine this drawing. And here's what Rudy came up with here. Now you can see it coming into view here. This craft was about 20 feet in diameter and had two bands wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself. Uh, three small humanoid bodies, about three and a half to four feet tall, all having oversized head, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth, minute nose. Uh, they were on stretchers on the floor. Off to the right and left of the craft were these 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy trucks with tarped debris and heavy chains covering the tarps. And he's looking at all this. And this went on for a couple of days. By the end of the week, they were caught and his father was reprimanded for bringing his son who saw all this. So it did not end well for his father here. Here's the full color rendering by Joel Christopher Payne. Want to give him credit here. And you can see the six-year-old boy kind of looking through the doorway uh, while all this is going on. So you can imagine that uh, it'd be very interesting to see what happened to all this. And I want to mention too that we're still not even at Roswell yet. We're we're only we're only 1946 time frame. And if you go back in time, you go to 1942. This would be Battle Los Angeles. Two craft were recovered. Then we go a little bit further back. We've got 1941, April 20th, 1941, Cape Girardeau. There were three bodies recovered there. And then if we take it even further back to 1933 in Italy, there was another crash retrieval. So. Already we're five, six in, and we're not even at Roswell yet. So this is going way back prior to Roswell here. Okay, next one, Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, 1946. This was a private who worked in records management. And the source for this one is Space the Final Frontier, page 59 by Clark McClellan. That's the source for this one. Here's the cover of the book. And within the book, there is a sketch here, and this is what the sketch looked like from the primary eyewitness. Now, this thing was 15 feet in diameter, it was seven feet tall, no rivets, no seams, no weld marks, no visible means of propulsion. There were no socket head cap screws. There were no hex head cap screws. Um, there was a section, a flat section wrapped around the outer circumference that had these rectangular windows. Now this thing arrived at the base from Arkansas on a railroad flat car. That's how it got here. So again, this is from the original witness. And so here is my cleaned up AutoCAD drawing. And if you look in the upper right, I've peeled back the skin that allows you to look inside the craft itself. Now there was a central column that was about three feet in diameter that started at the very bottom of the craft at the center, rose vertically and connected to the top of the craft. And I wanna to mention too that this entire interior, you could look through these windows, it was antiseptically sterile inside. So there were no bodies, there were no debris, there were no control panels, there were no buttons and switches. It was antiseptically sterile. Now, if you look at this red dot on the front window here, this is the attempted point of entry where these lab coat technicians were trying to gain entry to the craft. So they were using a diamond tip drill bit. This comes up at least two other times in these cases here. So We've got white lab coat technicians that are desperately trying to breach the hull of these craft to reverse engineer the propulsion and weapon systems and any other thing they can gain to this. So here was my first pass illustration just to give you an idea of what this thing may have looked like. And then this is Joseph Ray's full color illustration now really maintaining an import, important part of our national history by the use of these illustrations here. Uh, here's Rudy's drawing. So you can see when this private records management came into the hangar at Wright Patterson Air Force Base back then, Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, he was met with an MP who was a friend. And this MP said, you know what? 
I've got something I want to show you. So he brings him in the hangar. He shows him this crap. And this guy is shocked. He cannot believe what he's seeing. He saw that there was a tarp that was folded off to the right of the craft. And then in the foreground, what you see is a toolbox and then this electric drill with a diamond tip drill bit. That's the scene here. So let's go to Joseph's full color rendering. And now you can kind of see what this entire scene may have looked like if we were actually there in real time and could have been there back in 1946. Okay, next one. Papagos Indian Reservation. West of Globe, Arizona. This is January 1947, north of Superstition Mountains. Page 93, case A10. And I'm going to go to the sketch here. So you've got two military personnel going down an unimproved road, not too far from the Superstition Mountains, and they are challenged by MPs with rifles. And obviously, they were not supposed to be there. They were at the wrong place at the wrong time, but it was too late because about another 150 feet off to the left, they saw a 30-foot diameter dish-shaped craft came in in about a, about a 30-degree angle. It was 18 feet tall, had a dome on top. There were two bands wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself, and then what looked like indented windows between those bands. And they're seeing all this. It was already too late. They already saw this. <laughs> They were immediately told to vacate the area, but not before they saw the uh, beginning stages of this retrieval operation. And I'm going to go to the next slide here. Now you can see this is <clears throat> Joel Christopher Payne's illustration of what this thing may have looked like. And, you know, we, we really still haven't even got to Roswell yet, and we're five or six retrieval operations in already. Next one, White Sands Missile Range. July 4th, 1947. Primary source was a technical sergeant, U.S. Army Air Force, page 196 in the book. Now, this operation took place at night. This is about a 150-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. This entire operation was excruciatingly well lit. They had light alls. They had industrial lighting. They had spotlights. They had searchlights shining on this craft, came down at about a 30 degree angle. And also want to mention that they had people with Geiger counters walking around this craft. They had still photography. They had motion picture film reel going on of this. So they absolutely have film of this operation. Let's go to the next slide here. Now you can get an idea of what this may have looked like. And there was a, a team definitely documenting this entire operation by both still photography, motion picture film reel here. So what's the actionable item? Since still photography and motion picture film was recorded of this event, senators and congressmen with the appropriate security clearances should track down and utilize this evidence for future public hearings. So when we hear about these recent congressional hearings on UAP, they never talk about these operations, but yet somewhere in a vault at Andrews Air Force Base, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, could be Edwards Air Force Base, there is a library <laughs> where they have all these motion picture film reels. So that could be brought into congressional hearings. That's what actually needs to happen here. All right, next one. Carrot Patch, south of Salinas, California. This is July, August, 1947 seen by two 19-year-old workers at a nearby field. So they were at the right place at the right time. This came down the night prior. Now, when the two 19-year-old workers got to work the morning of, the foreman came to them and told them that this craft actually came down. This is the original sketch that came with the craft. This was about nine feet in diameter, four feet tall. It was not a large craft. There were two indented window sections wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself. It had a flat top. There was no low rise dome. And actually, we have a map that shows you where this thing came down. So X marks the spot. We could go here and get probably within a quarter mile, plus or, minus, plus or minus of a quarter mile of where this craft came down. But it's been so long now, I don't think we're going to 
have any trace effects here, but here's the original AutoCAD drawing I came up with based on the original sketch. So again, this thing was nine feet diameter, four feet tall with a flat top. And this was the first pass illustration that gives you an idea of what this thing may actually have looked like if we were there. And I'm gonna to go to Rudy's drawing. So before the military got there, these two young 19 year old workers came up to this thing. One of them kicked this thing with his boot. So he made contact with it and they're looking at this thing. They're shocked within about five minutes there was a convoy of military army vehicles that arrived at the scene. They were all told to get out of here immediately. So they were about an eighth of a mile away, but they saw this whole operation. They saw army personnel basically lift this craft onto the back trailer of this troop transport and move this out of here in haste, like very quickly. So I want to go to the full color illustration by Joel Christopher Payne. Now you can kind of get an idea of what this retrieval operation looked like based on not only the eyewitness testimony, but the original sketch that we have with the case itself. All right, next one. This is 1947. UFO crash retrieval seen at a warehouse at Berkeley University of all places, right? You wouldn't think that we'd hear about something here, but that's what this primary eyewitness is telling us here. It's hey, Ma hey, Marco. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, let's just take about. Um, we are at the bottom of the hour here. Okay. And for th those of you that joined us late, we are talking with Michael Schratt, and he is he's a digger. He finds <laughs> things that hardly anybody else get their hands on, and he's showing us some of this in regard to. UFO or UAP crash retrievals, and this is getting interesting. And also, uh, I will ask you if you like what you hear and see, please subscribe. And also, uh, the super chat is wide open if you want to support us there. Also, we would sure appreciate it. So thank you, and Michael, you're back on. I, I don't feel like I need to say anything. This is so good by itself, but you just uh -huh. go ahead and run with it. Okay, we'll, we'll continue. Now, I want to mention that we do have the name of the source on this case, Albert Bruce Collins, deceased. He was a metallurgical engineer. Now, he was at the right place at the right time where this 18-wheeler tractor-trailer lowboy truck backed in to a warehouse at Berkeley University. I'm going to go to Rudy's drawing here. And what he saw was this 30 foot long egg shaped craft, 15 feet tall. There was a hull breach. It looked like a cracked egg. Inside the cracked egg, there was an interior yolk that was about three feet in diameter. Now, in the forward portion of this craft itself, there was a composite panel. Wrapped around the outer circumference of this interior yolk was another composite panel. And then he said that on the lower right part of the craft itself, there was what looked like a hole breach where there were shrapnel coming out. So it, it sounds like there was an interior implosion in this craft. Now, my question is, is this the entire craft itself or is this the propulsion system of something larger that it fits inside? Because if that's the case, the actual craft itself would be much larger. So I think that's a, a very interesting question we, we need to look at here. Here's Joel's full color resolution uh, image of what this thing may have looked like. And you can see our primary source here. And this was at Berkeley back in 1947. Be interesting to see if we could get a piece of debris from this retrieval operation within the public domain. That would help move this whole field forward here. All right, next one, C-119 flying boxcar, Sierra Madre Valley, Mexico, prior to 1951. I believe this is 1948 time frame. Prime, primary source was an engineer. He worked in highway construction. Page 32 within the book, there were at least two bodies recovered, and the craft was about nine feet in diameter. Now, how do we know this, right? How can we know the diameter of the craft itself? Well. If you look at the measurements 
on the inside cargo bay interior walls of a C-119. It's nine feet, 10 inches. So if you have a nine foot diameter dish shaped craft that allows five inches of clearance on either side. So that's why we know that whatever this craft was that they recovered, it could not have been any more than nine feet in diameter. That's how we've got a mathematical certainty on that. So here you see the retrieval operation. This engineer was asked by the US military to aid in the retrieval operation. And so you've got the clamshell bay doors opened up and they're moving this craft by this ramp section with a cable inside the craft itself, inside the cargo bay of the C-119. And I'm gonna to go to the next slide here. This is Joseph Race full color illustration that shows you what this retrieval operation may actually have looked like. And if you look in the foreground, you can see these small ET bodies. They were very small. The primary source said that their skin was burned. So when they entered our atmosphere, maybe they had a pressure differential, something happened. There was high heat employed and their, their skin was burned because he said that when he touched their skin, their burnt skin came off on his finger. So it was not, you know, for the, it was more of a, a, a gruesome type situation associated with the bodies here. But I just want to, you know, reference that bodies were retrieved in this operation. And now you can see them bringing the craft up into the interior of the C-119 flying boxcar. All right, next one. Pentagon, 1952, off limits room. UFO crash retrievals, page 152, case one. So this was an office worker who somehow entered an off-limits room, probably at the basement at the Pentagon. We know now that there is a vast underground basement at the Pentagon where they most likely keep a lot of this information. The 8 by 10 glossy white, black and white photographs, the color photographs, the motion picture film reels. It is believed that this is a repository for a lot of this information. So she's going down into the basement. She goes through these double doors and she's kind of entering this dark, dusty room. It's dingy. There's some cardboard boxes. Uh, it's, it's very dark. And she kind of like turns to the side and she is shocked at what she sees. And I'm going to go to Rudy's drawing to show you what she saw here. She saw a pickled alien in a glass jar. Just right off the bat, she sees this and she's shocked. She can't believe what she's seeing. This is 1952 at the Pentagon. Within five seconds, literally five seconds, she feels this MP's hand on her arm shoulder area telling her to get out of here immediately. And she was, you know, basically sternly warned not to talk about this. Uh, Leonard eventually contacted her years later. She wouldn't talk about it. Again, 1952 at the Pentagon. Next one, Camp Polk, Louisiana, summer 1953. Herman Johnson is the primary source, and this is case A1, page 80 in the book. And we'll go to the next drawing here by Rudy. And I want to just kind of highlight now, when this craft came down, this 30-foot long, kind of the size of a small house, egg-shaped craft, the soil that it came down on was still warm when the retrieval team got to the area. So that's point number one. Now, point number two, this thing was 30 feet across, looked like an egg. There was a fin that wrapped around the outer portion of the craft itself. It was still rotating when they got there. There was one humanoid body taken alive. There were three others that were assisted by medical personnel and that's what you see kind of in the foreground here in the center so they were assisted and these beings were about three and a half feet tall slight build they walked as though they had no knee joint so it was this staggered step type operation they were wearing a one-piece tight-fitting flight suit they had helmets on and they had what looked like mittens on too and so that's kind of what this scene looks like Let's go to Joseph Race, full color illustration here. Now you can kind of see this whole scene coming into view. You've got this red soil 
still warm, still hot. You've got the ambulance truck there. You've got multiple Jeeps at the scene. We're going to zoom in here. And now you can see these beings with the helmets. They've got mittens. They've got one piece tight fitting flight suits that comes up multiple times. We always hear about these fully integrated one piece tight fitting flight suits that keeps popping up again and again here. Uh, now you can see that one being being uh, brought over to the ambulance truck. And in the report, it said that his comrades were trying to establish two way communication with their fallen friend here. That's mentioned in the book as well. One wow. final illustration on this one here shows you what this whole scene looked like here. Can you imagine being here and being involved in this retrieval operation? When you read the firsthand military sources description of this operation, he really puts you there. You really get the feeling that you're at the scene with him here. Okay, next one. And this is one of my favorites here. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 1953. Michael Olvey, he's the source. He was Army Reserve's warrant officer. UFO crash retrievals, page 15, abstract number eight. Again, this is 1953. So it's at night. Hangar complex number four, I believe, is where this went down. And if you look where I've got the arrow here, that's Bay E. I've actually been inside that hangar bay. This is what it looks like on the exterior. So you've got a four-engine DC-7 transport, cargo transport, comes in at night at the base. And this is what this scene looked like here. Imagine this taking place inside the hangar. So this DC-7 taxis up on the tarmac, enters the hangar, hangar bay doors close, and on, on the port aft cargo bay door section opens up, and there's a forklift starts offloading these wooden crates. So I'm going to take you inside the hangar now. So let's take this scene and move it inside the hangar. And this is what this warrant officer saw. He saw that when this forklift dropped the for forks down to the hangar floor, there were five <clears throat> wooden crates. The three wooden crates on top had their lids removed exposing three ET bodies, about three and a half to four feet tall, oversized head, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth, minute nose. <clears throat> they were all wearing a one-piece tight-fitting flight suit. And he said, one of these beings was female because it had breasts, he said. And then he also said that these beings were being suspended off the bottom of the crates by a white netting that protected them from the dry ice freezer burn below, which is something that I thought was interesting. So, and you can imagine, he was about five, six, seven feet away from this thing, and he's looking inside these wooden crates. So I'm going to take you to the next illustration here. This is Joseph Ray's illustration that shows you this entire scene. Now, he had also heard about the debris that was recovered in this operation. So let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to give you a 90 degree look down view on the bodies now. And that's what this looks like here. And one of these was female, according to the primary source within this case. And we actually have his name here. All right, we're going to go to the next case. This is Walker Air Force Base, New Mexico, April 12, 1954, page uh, 82 in the book. And I want to mention that Walker Air Force Base used to be Roswell Army Airfield. So we're talking about the same place of the 509th Bomb Group here. Next slide. So primary source was a photographer. He knew about cameras. He knew about lighting. He knew about exposure. And so he thought, you know, my skills might be helpful to the military. And so he joined the military. And on this particular day, he and his teammates were told to board a Sikorsky H-19 helicopter that you see right here, like the same model, virtually the same type model here. And the pilot in command over the uh, intercom system said, gentlemen, this is not a drill. This is a real world operation. So they take off 
They head northbound. The freeway is to their right. They make a left-hand turn. By this time, it's starting to get dark. And what do they see when they come, come over this hill? They see a 50-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. This is at night. Came in at about a 45-degree angle. And he's in the helicopter with the cargo bay door open. And he's taking photographs while they have a spotlight shining down on this. Now, there were four ET bodies dead and outside the craft laying around the vicinity of where this craft came down. He later learned that within the entryway hatch, they found another two. So there were six bodies recovered. Now, I want to mention one thing very interesting. When they landed the helicopter and the primary source got out, his very first reaction is that he said that the entire vicinity of where this craft came down smelled like automobile battery acid. That's the first thing he noticed. Okay, so we're going to go to the next slide here. And now you can see the full color rendering here. There was a series of multicolored lights that were wrapped around the outer circumference that were still rotating when they got there. Now, by this time, military convoy had already arrived. The retrieval operation is in full swing. And uh, he also saw one of the people throw up right next to him. This is one of the cr uh, crew members of the retrieval operation. Got sick immediately because of this acrid battery acid smell that permeated the entire area. That's something that we hear about in other cases as well. All right, next one. And these are all in chrono chronological order by date here. The other Roswell UFO crash on the Texas Mexican border. This is spring 1955, and I want to give credit to Noe Torres and my good friend uh, Ruben, who did the legwork on this. They did a great job here. And so this is south of Del Rio, Texas. And I want to kind of set the scene here. So you've got four F-86s that are basically escorting three B-47s heading westbound, and this is kind of near southern Texas area. And if you look at the map here, you see Del Rio. And as they're flying, there's a dish-shaped craft that goes screaming right by their flight path. So one of the F-86 Sabre jets has to break away formation, which he does. And he follows this craft that is sparking, crosses the Rio Grande, and then crashes on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande River. And I'm going to go back one here. Now you can see him doing a low pass over the crash scene. He saw this whole thing. So he makes a left-hand turn. He flies to Carswell Air Force Base. He gets out of the F-86. He drives to Corsica, which is a general aviation airport. He's joined with a friend. They climb into a two-seat tail dragger Aranka and go fly back to the crash scene before it's nighttime. So I'm going to go forward here. Here's what it looked like when they landed. So there were two people, the, the primary source and his friend. And what they see is a 25-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. It had left a debris trail before it settled into a rest area. There was a, a small low-rise dome that had popped off that was further downrange here. And the Mexican military is already on site. You can see six by six troop transport off to the upper left. And he, he's looking at all this and he's absolutely shocked at what he sees. There were four badly burned bodies associated with this retrieval operation. And I'm gonna zoom in here, give you an idea of what these beings look like here. Now, Air Force pilot Robert Willingham was the primary source. And he said that these beings had quote unquote arms that look like broomsticks, according to Robert Willingham. And I'm going to go to the next slide here. Here's the full color resolution uh, rendering by Joel Christopher Payne. And you can see this debris trail that this craft left behind. Now, there's an interesting point here. As it got darker, it started getting colder here. So the Mexican military, and there were a lot of them there surrounding this craft, according to the primary source, 
what they were doing is they were going off to the six by six troop transport off into the upper left here, and they were pulling out blankets. They were putting blankets on the debris, which was still warm at the time. And then once the blankets were warmed up, they were putting these on their bodies to warm them up, so which I thought was a very interesting kind of like historical point to this that actually adds credibility to the case. So let's go kind of inside the craft now. These bodies were burnt, they were mangled. Uh, it wasn't for the faint of heart, it was a gruesome scene, but that's what Robert Willingham had described according to this retrieval operation. Okay, next one. I want to give credit to Clifford Stone who dug up this case. This is a retired Air Force pilot, late 1950s. This was an interview that was conducted by Ed Camerack Jr about a five to six minute film clip associated with this particular Air Force pilot. And what he said is within this film clip that he saw, a 60 foot diameter dish shaped craft, about 10 feet wide gash on the upper dome of the craft. There were bodies recovered about five feet tall and inside the craft itself, and this is all in this six minute film clip, he said that there were buttons and switches and dials and levers within this six minute film clip here. I want to give credit. Here's kind of an enlargement of what the propulsion system may have looked like and this display screen on the inside part of the dome itself here. And we'll go on to the next one here. This is Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah, and Michael also, uh, Michael. Yeah, I need to tell you, we have uh, seven and a half minutes left of the show. So okay. I want to leave you a little time towards the end where, you know, talk about your book and uh, no how problem. we can get a hold of you too. So no kind of yep. pace, can, pace, can, pace yourself there. We can wrap ourselves up here on this one. So this is April 1962. We had a transient group of pilots that are part of the 350th Tactical Air Command fighter wing. And they're, they're running down this row of hangars at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They were looking for this mobile racquetball club. And as they went to this one hangar complex, the door was open. They walk, they run inside, and they see this interesting 15-foot diameter dish-shaped craft propped up by engine test stands. They were challenged, stating that they're not supposed to be there, but they did see this thing. And I, I trust the credibility of first-hand military fighter pilots. They had no reason to lie. Uh, I want to go to what this pilot said here. Now, this is a, one, of, one of the pilots here. The guard challenged by saying, I don't think you're supposed to be here, sir. I replied to the affirmative, and we turned about face and departed, mumbling to ourselves that the good old U.S. had developed or had all along flying saucers in service. So, when you hear this kind of information coming from credible first-hand military fighter pilots, I think it's something that we should actually take to heart. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, the, we uh, have uh, maybe one last comment on some of these. Uh, yeah, and well, then... Uh, I will cer certainly want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to join all of you. Uh, I hope I presented this, uh, the, the different cases where I've provided the information where people can verify this, they can read about this within Leonard's book here. Um, again, as you mentioned, I have a book called Dark Files, A Pictorial History of Lost, Forgotten, and Obscure UFO Encounters. It kind of follows the same format as this presentation. It's all illustrated. It's all referenced. So you can check the references to verify this. Um, kind of follows the, the same format here. But I'm going to continue tracking down these military witnesses. And I think it's important that we make these cases come alive, preserve an important part of our national history. And we need to track down these remaining legacy crash retrieval witnesses before they all pass away because once they pass away we'll never be able to get their comments within a congressional yeah. hearing setting here that's why it's important that we track these people down now yeah well you know wow. you 
that's you're getting the facts on this, but what about your opinion? Do you mm -hmm. think that most of what we see in the sky is from Earth made crafts or are they there, for there is a there is a significant majority of man-made craft that follow the form fit and function of quote unquote ET spacecraft. And at this point it's seamless because people would would not really be able to tell the difference unless you get up close to these things. Obviously, if you have seams and rivets and fasteners and you have flashing lights and you have low yeah. frequency electrical humming noises, if you have those telltale signs, you'll be able to tell the difference. But now that we're so long down the road here, we've been doing this for 80 years and we've got billions of classified black budget funding going into these programs and being ciphered from other projects to pay for other black programs. This has been going on for 80 years. It's at okay. a point now where it's going to be very difficult to tell the difference. And if they ever tried to pull something, they'd be able to fool a lot of people. So that's why it's urgent that we consider some of yep. these cases here. Yeah. Well, it's a little easier now with the new uh, whistleblower laws that has came on the books. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, gosh. What do you think, Nora? This must have been the easiest show we've ever done. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Just, just so excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Great to be both with both of you. Thank you very much. Yeah, this this has been wonderful, and uh, I highly recommend. I went to uh, uh, to Amazon, and uh, I found the book there. And I, the book that you're talking about, the other one where uh, they talk about all these retrievals, you have yeah. the pictures and the drawings in addition to that. So uh, maybe your book will be a little more complete. Uh, well, yeah, there there are no drawings or illustrations in, in Leonard's book. And that's why I thought it was important to, to make these cases come alive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is good. Oh, wow. Well, we're, we're down to the end here. And uh, I have a favorite question that I like to ask at the yeah. end of show sometime. First, well, first of all, uh, if they want to connect with you, let's say that there's a guy that has been working at S4 and he is oh, yeah. itch, itching to come forward with something. Right. How how do they get a hold of you? You can get a hold of me through Facebook. You can get a hold of me through email. So uh, you can get a hold of me through my YouTube channel, which is Michael Schrapp. Mm -hmm. Those three ways. Okay. Good deal. Well, there's my question. If you could talk to the whole world and the world is listening, yes, what would you tell them? I would tell them that we have a bright future in store if we choose to take the responsibility and grab the opportunity now before it's too late. And, and the, the way we can do that is to reach out to these remaining credible firsthand military sources and encourage them to come forward as a united coalition, not as an independent onesie or twosie, but come together as a united coalition. And when we have that body of evidence, the government is going to be hard pressed to squelch those witnesses because coming together as one voice is going to be a lot more powerful than a lone wolf. And that, that would be my, uh, my request. Yeah. Yeah, I I think you're right. And uh, any well, Nori, we're down to the end here, so we better yeah. go. Yeah. Take care, take care, everybody. We have to have Michael come back. There's just too much uh, information, you know. Sure. So sure. We'd love to have you back, Michael. Thank you. That'd be great. Yes, no that'd be great. Okay, until next week, be good to each other. <laughs>